Street Life Ministries is a Christ following nonprofit that serves homeless folks on the Mid Peninsula. We meet really interesting people. And today, we'd like to share one of those with you. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm here with my friend Doug, uh, who's decided to come in and share his story with us today. Um, but, Doug, before we get started, if you don't mind, if we just go ahead and uh, pray, and then we'll get go ahead and get started. Uh, Lord, Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you right now, Father God, and we just ask you to uh, just navigate this conversation. Look over my brother Doug as he is currently living on the street, and uh, we are working on trying to get uh, Doug into some housing. Um, and yeah, Lord, just watch over my brother as he is uh, um, trying to find his place in life, God. And uh, bless our conversation today and all that is entailed, Lord. And just thank you so much for uh, Doug coming in today and opening up his heart to all the folks that listen and watch uh, this podcast. So we just say thank you so much in your son's holiest name, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Cool. Right on, brother. So how you doing? You doing good? Uh, yeah, a little tired. I'm waking up early and I'm going all day long and then into the late evening yeah uh, because there's always something going on and I'm trying to stay busy um, you know those of us that battle the addiction we know that one of the easiest ways to stay clean is to stay busy right right and you know with healthy things so right. I've been volunteering with street team and or downtown street team and then that looks like might turn into something else so uh, cool cool um i'm just trying to stay busy yeah stay out of my head that's the worst place i could go you know cool so tell tell us a little bit about your yourself so born and raised uh i was born in southern california well Santa Barbara County, so Santa Maria, California. Mm -hmm. um, but we moved from there to Arizona where my second sister was born. I'm the oldest um, of three. And then we went to, from there to Florida. My father worked for Nassau. Hmm. Um, Cocoa Beach? Yep. Um, that's, we, have, we have family there. Yeah. It's the only place that I was like, Looking in the sky, it's sunny and it's rainy. Yeah. And I'm like, there's not a cloud in the sky. How is it raining? <laughs> and yeah. it's warm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a trip. Yeah, it was a it was it was fun though. When we came back to California, I was what, five years old. Okay. And you came back to this area? We moved to San Francisco back at first, and my parents were looking for a house, and finally bought a house in South City. And so from 1966 through 79, 70, 78, 79 or so, I was in South City. I graduated South City High in 78. Cool. So, so I'm an old dude. <laughs> <laughs> so mom and dad stay together? Uh, yeah, my father died kind of early. He died at 54. Oh, so sorry to hear that. Yeah, it kind of messed me up. <clears throat> yeah, I bet. Were you and your dad close? Yeah, we were pretty close. I mean, we were always at each other, mm -hmm. but I knew he loved me and he knew I loved him. You okay. know what I mean? Sure do. I rarely heard him say it to me. Yeah. But I knew. I mean... Right. He's just that kind of guy. Yeah. I, I, I think a lot of men were back in that day. Um, so is he a military guy? Yeah. So he was kind of a hard guy. Yeah, it hard was guy. his way to the highway. Yeah, you know? yeah. You're either going to do it like this or you can see that door? Yeah. Keep on going. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, wow, he's serious. What did he pass away from? Uh, well, the... <laughs> What's listed is a heart attack, mm. but he only had a heart attack because of a bot surgery that they did on him for what they call an ulcerated intestine, which was caused by alcoholism. Mm. Um, I knew he was, he had a serious problem way back. I had to pick him up from the police department three times, and the third time I said, that's it, never again. 
you need to get help. Now, this is his oldest son, who's just like 18 years old now, telling his father that shit. Sorry. That stuff. It's okay. Uh, you know, you need to, you're, you're mean when you're drunk. I can handle you. You don't bother me, but it's mom and the girls. I see them. They're scared. I see the fear in their eyes. Yeah, yeah. I see how mom acts. I said, it's not fair to them. Sure. I said, so this is the last time. So you do what you need to do, but I'd maybe go look into one of those things like AA or something. Not knowing anything about AA at that point in right. my life. And, you know, I was talking with a uh, psychiatrist about it or a counselor or somebody in that realm. I said, you know, I told my dad that. And, I, and he says, well, that was a good thing. He goes, you know, you have a high rate, higher rate of <laughs> becoming an, uh, an addicted person, too, than he does. I'm like, no way. I'll never I don't even like drinking alcohol. I drink with my friends, and it's like, <clears throat> it just doesn't do it for me. It makes me tired, and I want to go to sleep. And Sure. Yeah. And I, alcohol is the one thing that I can tell you I can use, and I can't control my actions. Mm. So I shy away from things where I come out of myself and I can't control what I'm doing got in a lot of fights drinking mm -hmm. so I kind of learned that's not a good thing for you to be doing right right uh, so yeah so your dad passed away when you were about 18 yeah uh, no I was 24 24 yeah I was going to college I had taken two years off and went back you know so I was in my second year of really my first year okay because the first year I spent talking to the girls at the fountain at CSM. Okay. Just never went to class. Right, right. I had more incompletes than I had crates. Right, right. <laughs> uh, not a, another not a good thing, but that's <laughs> where my head was at that time. Sure, sure. Young and stupid and, you know, you think you know everything, but you really know squat. So you, you graduated from CSM then? No, I never graduated. Um, knowing so I had this talk okay let me back up so I come from a split religion household mm -hmm. my father's a Buddhist my mother's Catholic okay um, they're both full-blooded Japanese just like I am but that's how it ended up being my mother was Catholic mm -hmm. so I never went to church sure. I never knew much about that side of the religion and stuff like that. Sure, sure. Um, only time I would go to church is when my aunties would drag us to church, mm -hmm. when they were watching us when my parents were away or something. Mm -hmm. um, weddings and funerals. Right. Other than that, I never won't walk step foot in the church. Sure. So when when my dad asked me on his deathbed, basically, to make sure I. I do some things. He made me make, make some promises to him. And mm -hmm. Yeah, some I kept and some I did. And the ones that I didn't were out of my control, but I still am pretty hard on myself about that. But at my age now, there's not much I can do about it. So, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Sure. Um, you know, I know he's the one that picks if, whether you're having a boy or a girl. It's not me. Mm -hmm. So, um, do you have kids? I have a daughter. Okay, how old is she? She is thirty. Thirty. Okay, she lives around here in the area. Or? She lives in the area, but we're kind of estranged through my active addiction. Okay. Um, we talk by phone, and and she says, "Yeah, I'll get. We'll get together soon, Dad." <laughs> soon is your mom. The next is your mom still around? No. How long ago did she pass away? I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I don't oh. talk to my family, haven't talked to my family in 20 years. Even your sisters? Do you, They're they have, dead to me. Oh. I, I hate to be so blunt and so, but that's where they need to stay. Okay. Uh, There's no chance of forgiveness there? You know, I try, but, and you know what, I'm getting better at it, so maybe I'll give it a shot sometime soon, I don't know. Not to because get not to get overly religious on you, but you know, 
Christ, Christ calls us to forgive. I, I, I know. I was that sixty days in jail that I did falsely. Uh, I was, some passages I was reading was about. It's like, you know, hold, when you, you got to forgive, you hold on to anger, you for anything. God says if we hold on to anger in our heart towards somebody, that's just, just as much as murder. Yeah. So I mean, what whatever they did, avoid. whether it's legit or not, you need to let it go, brother. I know it's. Because that's probably better, also, probably also one of the late Because I just don't think about it. And now I don't see bread like I do. I used to. I yeah. Mean, just off the chart angry in a nanosecond. Yeah. Yeah, so you have some anger issues? Oh, yeah. Always have had. Yeah. You know, as a kid, you know, you get mad and angry. And, and you got to do something. Everybody has some thing that helps them get over it. Right. I had to break something, physically destroy it. Sure. And I've always been that weirdo that had to do that, but that's the only way I could get over sure. something. Um, I get, and again, as I age, and yeah, I can only say it's like the last 10 years of my life, uh, I've been gotten really good at not destroying shit. Not mm -hmm. Getting, I, mean, I might be angry, but I'm not gonna um, be so abrasive that it becomes confrontational. Mm -hmm. So I'm learning. So what is your so really quick? So um, probably go down a couple rabbit trails here. So what is your drug of choice? Uh, my drug of choice is uh, marijuana, really. Okay. Um, I'm. If I had just stuck to that stuff, I would have no problems. I yeah. would still be probably professionally employed. Uh, well, who knows? I might have still gotten hurt, but who knows? What did you used to do professionally? Um, I used to run um, parts and service in car dealerships. Hmm. And I was really pretty good at it. Um, my knack was being able to take a dealership that, that was in the toilet and customer satisfaction and turn it around very rapidly. Um, so the Honda guys liked me, Honda and Acura guys, because they knew if I was going there, th mm -hmm. that dealership was now going to be one of the top ones in the district. It's like 36 or 50 dealers. and. I've taken so many of them that were dead last, and within a month to three months, the dealership that I'm at then is now number one, and they're like, how the fuck does he do that? Hmm. But it's really easy. Um, just don't lie to people, be honest, be up front. Um, treat them. I used to tell my guys this. So when you're in the service drive and you're writing them up, treat them like you're talking to yourself. Mm -hmm. Because you wouldn't take some shitty answer, and these people don't want to take that either. Sure. So treat them like, talk to them like you're talking to yourself, and you will never run into a hot customer. Mm. So, okay, so I know a little bit about your history, so I just kind of want to walk through it a little bit. So, 24, you're out of college. Um, your, what did you? What was your next? What did you do next? So, my father goes, well, <laughs> passes away, and I'm an angry son of a bitch. Mm -hmm. uh, that day probably changed me till the last two years. I'm gonna say of my life. Okay. Um, I swore off that there was no God. I cursed him. Mm. Um, you name it. I, didn't believe in him. Mm -hmm. So going to a 12-step program, man, I was struggling with that one. Were you using it 24? Uh, no. Okay. Not, I was smoking weed. Oh, that okay. I didn't do anything else. Oh, okay. okay. And had I just followed that path, I'd be just another one of those hippie guys from Berkeley. Just, <laughs> you know. But had a good life and been successful and not in... Not have a criminal jacket, <laughs> but uh, 
So did you stay at home? Did you stay with your mom for a little while after he passed away, or were you already living on your own? No, when, uh, when I was living at home, and so right after the funeral, I I said to myself, "Well, your mom's got your two sisters to put through college still so by herself now. She's a single parent. You know how tough that is today for even two parents." Mm -hmm. um, I said, "You can." They, they're begging you to come to work over there, and you can make a good living there, but you won't be the richest guy in the neighborhood, but you're not going to be hurting either. Right. So I went to work for a car dealership. Okay. And, and you know, I started, my starting pay was 60 G's a year, and that was in seven, you know, 84. It's not bad money in 84. Sure. Um, today it's peanuts, but Right. Uh, so I moved out. Right after the funeral, I found an apartment right away, and I, Mom, I'm moving out. Well, why are you moving out? Because I'll just, I'll be here. I'll, you pick up the phone. I can be here in three minutes. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's time for me to be on my own. And you've got the girls, so you don't need my mouth around in here and me taking a bottle of hot water or whatever. Sure. You just don't need it. It's time for me to handle that on my own. So I did that and I knew she had to put him through school too and it was like, because my sister wanted to go to university, I really didn't care. If sure. I would've got, if I would've got my degree at CSM, I would've been happy with that. Right. But uh, I quit school because I knew I could get that job. And the only way I could move out is to have that job. Right, so right, right. It was pretty much a no-brainer to me. Hindsight, maybe I should have stuck it out and finished school. But I can go back. Sure. So you, you have this job, $60,000 a year, working in an auto dealership, and then so what are the next steps? I mean, obviously, you met somebody had a kid somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I met, um, at that same dealership, I met my daughter's mom. My oh, oh, okay. Okay. And uh, she tells me she's pregnant one day. And I went, oh, really? <laughs> and all I can hear is my father telling me, if you ever get a girl pregnant, you better marry her. Mm. So I immediately said, well, I guess we're going to have to get married then. Oh no, we don't have to get married to have a, a kid together. And I'm like, wait a minute, what? Right. Because now I'm like, wait a minute. But my dad said, you know, that's what he taught me. And everything he taught me, even when I thought he didn't know what the freak he was talking about, it was actually me that didn't know what he was talking about. I thought he knew it all. Right, right. It's funny how you'll remember something and you go, oh, sh he used to tell me that all the time. <laughs> so did you guys get married or no? Uh, first she said no. And then I was like, I flipped the other way. I was like, ooh, ooh, I don't have to get married now. <laughs> and then the minute she started to show, it was, we're getting married. I'm like, would you make up your mind already? You're <laughs> sending me on this up down thing. And we got married and we lasted, uh, so if we got married in 90. Like a month after she was, our daughter was, wait a minute, no, because, yeah, we got married in 90. I think just before my daughter was born. Yeah, I was thinking it was a month after, but... Right. No, before. So, um, we lasted till like, our divorce became final in 97, I think it was. Okay, so seven years? Yeah. Okay. Well, five and a half. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was all my fault. I'm, I can be a real knucklehead sometimes. 
<laughs> so, um, so I know I know there was there was also a time in your life where you were doing case management work, right? Yeah, that was fun. Actually, I found out it was something I really liked doing. Yeah, I didn't even. It was more rewarding to see progress in the person that you're trying to help, mm -hmm. and and going. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I just helped them do something that they weren't able to do before. So, did you have so we so would would you say that? All the long that you knew that you had an issue with, like smoking weed and and drinking and anger. And then oh yeah, did you always, so you as just far basically as tried to control weed. It? I just it was like that drug was made for me because it allowed me to be normal. Marijuana. Okay. Otherwise, I'm hyperactive and just all over the place. You would think I was on speed, just normally. Um, when did you when did you start using meth? Forty eight. <laughs> forty eight. Yeah, I was forty eight when they first started using. Oh, okay. Meth. Yeah. Yeah, that's been a while. Huh? Yeah. yeah, it's been a, well, quite a while. Yeah. Yeah, stuff's bad. Um, it's not good, and that's why you see what you see out here in Redwood City right now. What's that? The people, the zombies, the, uh, oh my God, I've never seen it this bad before. I've been talking about it with other people. I'm like, man, I've been in Redwood City seven years now, and I've never seen this many zombies walking around. What do you think is contributing to it? It's meth. But what's contributing to, like, the, okay, so. Because it's dirt cheap. It right. lasts a long time. Yeah. The people that were doing cocaine and crack are now doing meth. Right. Because right. you'll go through five grand over on this side, and you can go through maybe a hundred dollars over here on this side. Sure. It's a no brainer, but you have those holdouts. Well, I like this high better and whatever. Yeah. So what do you think what do you think causes your chronic relapsing? Uh, I know what it is. It's just so for me, if things are going well and I'm and I'm clean and sober at that point, mm -hmm. I'll stay that course. But it doesn't until things start going up and down and you hit a lull or when you spike downward and just an opportunity comes up and it's just as simple as that you know hey I got this you want it you know what yeah give me that right and that's all it took um, you know I left the shelter I was enrolled in school going to school for two weeks and I was approaching six years sober yeah, clean and sober, just recently. And um, because I didn't register for outpatient drug rehab, mm -hmm. they kicked me out of the shelter. And I said, wait, wait, wait. How would that benefit me more than the courses in psychology that I'm taking right now? to further my career from what I, just my last paying job. When, when was this? Uh, last year, oh, last okay. summer. Last summer. Okay. Yeah, and that was Maple Street and Life Moves. A different arm of Life Moves. Yeah. Because I, I'll tell you the one thing about Life Moves, their outreach team is awesome. Right. Well, it is now because the person that's in charge of it, it is just teaching her people what to do, how to do it. Right. There's a big difference before. Yeah. Well, things, you know, they, they come, they, it's, they, they have these waves, you know? Well, and, no, and they don't. They don't. 
it seems like now they're getting the training that they need sure. and and the tools that they need to be able to do the job. Before, I, they think they were so handcuffed they couldn't do anything. Sure, sure. Yeah, they've been a great organization for us to be partners with because they've helped us out a lot. So, they are. Uh, <laughs> There's something else. So, um, so how how so how many days sober do you have right now? I've got like less than a week right now. Less than a week. Yeah. Okay. We've got over five days. Five days. Yeah. What are you doing? Are you doing anything different? Just staying busy. Um, you doing any meetings? No, I haven't done any meetings. No sponsor? No sponsor. I yeah, those just would been talking to him a lot. Yeah, those, a lot. those would help though, right? What? A meeting and sponsors? Oh yeah, they do. <laughs> they do. But you know what? So, I contemplated this. Mm -hmm. Even am I even going to go back to NA? Well, I'll go back to NA and AA just for the meetings. Mm -hmm. Am I going to work at the program with the sponsor? Probably not. I I know how to do what I need to do and when to do it. Mm -hmm. It's just during the time I've been dirty, I really didn't want to want to be clean. I right. really didn't care. Right. You do now. Oh yeah, I see something now. It's like okay, there's an opportunity there, and you better because the last what 16, 17 years, it hasn't panned out. So I decided, um, <laughs> and my coworker Robin, she tells me, you know that rabbit rehousing is a setup for failure, and I said, depends on what you want from it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be a setup for failure. I said, I went off the streets so freaking bad, I'm willing to go back to work not fixed and just grit my teeth through it to get off the streets and pay that rent myself. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a step program where they showed me the graph on it yesterday, I think it was. It's 40% of uh, your income the first three months, and then it goes to 50% this, the next three months, and then it goes to 75, I think, 70, 75, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. And then at the one year mark, you're at 100% mm -hmm. re responsibility. And so I found an apartment here in Redwood City, which the property manager has, was supposed to call me yesterday, and he did it. So I'm gonna call him after this meeting mm -hmm. and see, but I'm also gonna look at a studio in San Mateo on Tuesday, I believe. Because the caseworker for Abode, who's helping me with the housing part right now, she told me, I guarantee you, I will have you placed in a, an apartment or a studio within 45 days. Hmm. Okay, let's see. It's pretty powerful. Yeah. So I have a big reason to stay clean. I'm going to have to pass drug tests. Hmm. I'm going to have, <laughs> yeah, I need a job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. I need a decent enough paying job or I need to do what I was going to do was uh, get a car and drive for Lyft and Uber at nights, weekends, whatever I needed to do to make my, sure, make sure that I can make my rent. Right. Um, she asked me what, would, what the ideal figure would be and I said, well, given the market, I said, I guess I'm going to have to go with 18 to 22. I can probably swing that range, but I'm going to have to work my ass off to, to crack that. You know, mm. I'll be working, I'll be sleeping less than I do now. <laughs> That's for damn sure. Yeah. But um, I can't do the streets anymore. It's just about took everything from me to the point where I it was pretty 
freaking angry. I was, I wanted retribution or retaliation so bad I could taste it. Yeah. And I talked to you and I talked to some other people and everybody just kept telling me, don't do a thing, just don't do anything. Talk to God. And I said, then, you know, if everyone wants me to do the right thing, which is nothing, and take this urge to do something out away from me because it's almost got me on the brink of like really bad places. How about right now? No, he's been doing it. Okay. It's been disappearing. So you said you said a while ago when your dad died you turned yourself turned away from God? Mm -hmm. how, how are you feeling about God now? Oh, I was wrong. It's just like with with my father. Yeah. I was wrong about him. Most of the things he told me that I said he didn't know what he was talking about, well, I, yeah. it was me. So, can I encourage you with something? Yeah. I think you should find a way to reach out to your sisters. Yeah, well, we'll see. Okay. Baby steps. Baby yeah. steps. Is your, mom, you, your mom's not alive, though, right? Yeah, no, okay. Alive. So, and but I really think you should. That's the reason why I don't talk to them. Well, it, why don't you talk to God about it and see what he says? <laughs> Yeah, that's I have not done that I because I'm, because you probably don't want to hear the answer. Yeah. So really quick, so we're gonna wrap things up here, but I just you know you touched on the streets and how you're tired of being on the street and stuff. Yeah, you know, you've been in and out of homeless here for a while. Yeah. For people who listen to this and watch this, I mean, a lot of the folks that are kind of like our, our followers, right? Um, one of the biggest reasons we do this is for people to kind of. You know, I get enough people to sit down in front of my camera or and listen and, and also record stuff for the podcast because I want the people that listen to this to kind of hear the voice of people who are dealing with homelessness or have dealt with homelessness. Um, so, somebody who's listening to this that's never experienced homelessness before, it's a tough life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I hear people, uh, I could be standing in a shopping. Mar or a supermarket, right? And you hear people, oh, those homeless people, they're all so lazy. And I laugh inside because I said, if you knew what it took to, to go one day just to get your basic needs met, you'd say, wow, that's a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. It's more than a full time job. Yeah. The work just to be homeless. Right. People think it's so easy. It's not that easy. Right. But, um, even though, as Dave pointed out, I'm not working with a sponsor or working the 12 steps, I do take suggestions still. And that's how I've gotten to where I am today, about to get into a place to live, so it seems. You know, um, are you coming to the bingo tomorrow? Yeah, I'm coming. So I got the survivors going to be there. Are they? You should talk to them. Yeah. Uh, I've talked to him before. I've seen him at Eaton, so. Yeah. He's just not my cup of tea. Okay. <laughs> hey, every, you know, that's the one thing about the rooms of recovery that I will say is that there's so many different walks of life that come through there. Eventually, you You'll will. You'll meet the person you yeah, need to I, meet. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Not, everybody's you, work, not everybody's for everybody, and I get that. Well, uh, you know. I mean, for the longest time, I've had. The reservations that I didn't even realize I had right. <laughs> until recently, you know? Sure. <laughs> but I guess uh, recognition is, is, is a very key point of growth. Sure. You know, if you don't realize it, then you're probably not going to grow from it. Yeah. <laughs> so how is, um, how is working with Downtown Street Team been pretty good? It's... it's actually fun I like it because I get to help people that I'm still around all the time uh, living with even you know what I mean mm -hmm. um, I think it's I think more organizations should come and do things um, more to the, there's a lot of things that can be done you know, that have been mentioned in that. I said, you know, we should have 
we should have classes or something, you know, refreshers on the daily living skills because a lot of people forget them out on the street. It's like, dude, you haven't had a shower in like 10 days. Could you please go take a shower? Right, right. <laughs> and I hate having that conversation with people. Or would you please brush your teeth? Right, right. And it's not the kind of thing that people want to hear all the time, but they need to hear it every once in a while because they don't know who they're... Well, they need account we all need accountability. Right, I mean, but, let's but face out it. on the street, sometimes you lose that because you really, you, you get to the fuck it. Yeah. I don't care. No, I get that. I give a shit. And that's a crappy place to be stuck in. Yeah. You know, I, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. You've been there. Yeah. It's not fun. No, I know it's not. But you uh, do know that you do know that we're trying to launch a recovery program, right? Yeah, you told talked to me so, about that. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Be cool, maybe you'd be a part of it. Uh, yeah, because, like I said, I'm not sure about NA, but I do like going to celebrate recovery mm -hmm. stuff because sure. it's still a 12-step program, basically. Yeah, but and I read that recovery Bible. And the 12 steps came out of the Bible anyhow, so I don't know, man. I'm leaning his way. There you go. Because like uh, he hasn't led me astray yet. Even though I even talked to you about this, I, I said, I don't know what he's trying to teach me, but he's been putting me through some stuff. Right. And I th I'll sit there and think and think and think, and a lot of it is in the beginning the most of it was patience it, it, that's what I keep, keep coming up with mm -hmm. well if I was patient this went to happen or if I was patient I went to react so quickly and it I could have went this direction and it would have been a lot smoother kind of thing I, I right now having everything taken so many times it's like what are you teaching me here? Because I really am failing to see what the lesson. It's material objects. You don't need them, dude. Yeah. That's what I've come up with. Cool. And so I think I found a little piece in that. However, it ferried it out. It, uh, I'm not kind of weird. It's, I'm kind of calm for, I was, Talking to myself, doing some self-talk. I said, "You're sh sure calm for all the stuff that happened to you." Because before, if that would have happened to you, how would you have reacted? Mm -hmm. oh, I said, "I'd be uh, sitting in jail or prison right now. That's for damn sure." And I said, "Well, it must be working. You better keep praying to." <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Because something's changing <laughs> in you that hasn't changed in six years. Yeah. And all of a sudden, so maybe it does work. I, uh, I would <laughs> say it does. So, I mean, I've been following Christ for 15 years. I got to, I got saved in Salvation Army, and it's been a it's been an unbelievable ride ever since. You know, I notice when I separate away from him, things get start going really bad again. It sure it? does. And then when I start following in his what he wants us to live like. Mm -hmm. They don't get better right away, but all of a sudden, st things start happening where you're going, how did that happen? Right. I didn't do a thing. How did that happen? Right. But maybe that's a blessing that he gave to me for being a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Cool. And Doug. so I, I truly believe yeah. in the power of Jesus Christ. Cool, right on, Doug. I mean, I've been sitting twice, it's happened to me at, at Street Life. I'm sitting there listening to the music and I hear something. And, and then this wave comes over me and I'm like, what the hell was that? Yeah. And then I, and then I start thinking about my parents or the dog. And I start crying and I don't cry. And that trips me out. Because my, I can't shut it off, it's just coming. Sure. And I'm like, what the hell was that? Sure. I think it was him telling me everything's going to be all right. Just keep following me. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know what else it was because uh, a few weeks ago I didn't really want to be here anymore. Mm. It was like, nah, man, no, I'm done. Mm. Too much pain. This is, and then this happens and that happens and this happens. I just can't take it no more. Forget it. Mm. But uh, somewhere that turned around too. Because I was asking him, show me something, please. Because I'm about ready to check out here. Right. And somebody mentioned to me, you know that he doesn't want you to do that because you'll never go to heaven if you do. And I went, oh, that's right. <laughs> so I had to do a little thinking, and things got better, just being patient, just letting things come rather than trying to force things. Right. You know? It's easier to play defense when you're playing defense rather than trying to play offense and defense at the same time. Sure, sure. So. Well, I'm glad you didn't do anything silly like that. Ty. I saw her the other day. I rode right past her. Oh, I know what you're talking about now. She didn't realize it was me until yeah. I went past her mm. and starts yelling. And I'm like, <laughs> I, just, I didn't even turn around. I just kept rolling. <laughs> there you go. Stay away from drama, right? That's the best way to do it. Well, that's kind of why I went all the way over there. Yeah. Because when we did that census count, yeah. I said, there's hardly anybody here now. I said, I think I'm coming back here. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I can be by myself and not have to deal sure. with as many people. But she's still over there. Oh, she's over there. Yeah. They moved her out, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're using that yard. They're, go look at, drive by it, and take a look. You'll see they've got count, they got uh, lane dividers spread out all over the place. They've got piles of uh, supplies here, there. They're taking up the whole lot so that people won't camp there. Oh. Well, Doug, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. Let go of the anger. Oh, sometimes it's so hard, though. Yeah. But uh, I'm getting a lot better at it. So maybe keep got, keep asking God. You'll chisel it away. I, I guarantee you that. Maybe it's that uh, you, you keep practicing. It becomes easier thing, kind of thing. And just keep praying about it, and God, and it just releases. God answers prayers. You know, it. You know, the one thing I've learned about having a relationship with Jesus is even though I want something to happen right now. It's always on his it's, time. It's on his time. And sometimes we have to walk through things because he's working on us because we won't respect it or on, or honor it if he just changes it and fixes it right away. Because we have this crazy thing called free will, right? So if he fixes it right away, sometimes, well, you know what? Maybe maybe if he fixes it too fast, I don't need him, right? And God, we have to be reliant. We have to rely on him, right? So sometimes some things like my pride and my ego... Right, I want him to get rid of it right away, and sometimes what he does is he just chisels at it slowly. So I realize, like, man, I can't do anything without him, because I have the, I have, I have, I have pride and ego issues that I've that I wrestle with. So, yeah, you know, I think most men do. It's, I think it's definitely a male thing for sure. You know, but I've seen some women that are like, wow, you're more stubborn than I am. <laughs> yeah, well. I think we're all just God designed us in, in certain ways, right? Yeah, but I'm. Uh, I don't know. I feel like for the first time in months, I, I've found some serenity. Good. I'm in a good place right now, and I want to stay there. So I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing because don't break, don't fix it if it's not broken. There you go. I like that. You know, and what I'm doing right now today, and hopefully I'll maintain that going forward, um, is just, it's working fine. So I'm just going to stay with that. You know, people want me, one submit, said to me, get it, oops, I just hit your mic, um, get another dog. And I'm like, oh, hell no, not till I get off the street. I'm not going to do that again. I right, said, wasn't fair to the dog. I feel so guilty, and I'm like, nah, I, I'm not doing that ever again. Wait until your 45 days are up. Wait till you get into a place so you even see if you can have a dog. Right. 
because you don't want to exclude yourself from getting a place. Right. That's what I would wait. Get a place. That way your dog, you know, it's safe. Right. Has a, a roof over its head. I wish. You know. I just, I, I'm not going to subject another animal to the homelessness. It's not fair to them. Right. Right. Really. Right. Yeah, I'm sorry about that loss, Doug. I yeah, know that was thanks. hard. I know that was hard. Yeah. So. That, really, that one really hurt. Yeah, I thought other had to put other dogs down, but that one just crushed me. Mm -hmm. How was your friend? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry about that loss. Thank you. Yeah, I'm getting better with that too. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your feelings. <laughs> sure. I appreciate just trying that. to be honest. Yeah. Just, you know that and doing for others is what's going to help keep me on my path that I need to stay on because it's very rewarding yeah the no drug can't, can't give me that feeling right just keep remember, reminding yourself that so all right thank all right. you you're welcome hello thank you so much for listening to my interview with Doug and uh, I just ask all of you who watch the video or listen to the podcast, just pray for Doug. Um, he struggles with depression and anger issues. There's obviously a lot of family history there um, that he's holding on to in his heart. And uh, we know um, that only God has the answer and the solution to letting that anger go. So Doug's struggling with his faith, as you can tell in this um, interview. And so I just ask all of you to continue to pray for him. And pray that uh, he hears God's voice and feels God's presence and truly accepts the Lord as his Savior. Because um, he's the only one that can change us and make us better. So thank you so much again for supporting us and listening to us. I ask all of you who watch us on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button um, so you get a notification when we um, uh, put out a new video. And for those of you who uh, listen to us on any of the podcast platforms, uh, again, subscribe, leave a comment, uh, let us know what you think, um, help uh, build our audience so we know, uh, get some feedback, What maybe something that you want to hear from us, maybe um, uh, different interviews that we can do. Um, we're, we're trying to grow this and trying to get the uh, um, awareness of what it's like to be homeless on the street to all of you, our viewers and our listeners. So we uh, uh, would love for some feedback. So please uh, let us know. Uh, what you think, and uh, maybe some uh, ideas on what you would like to hear and see um, on our podcast and our YouTube channel so we can grow it um, and uh, help the awareness so you understand what, what our folks go through. Um, it's, a, it's, a hard, it's hard being homeless. Living on the streets is not an easy thing. And so we, uh, yeah, we're grateful for you watching and listening. Thank you, and God bless you.